Hello everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Um, where are we today? We are, uh, oh, so already November, wow. So, um, we are talking today about a few different things, all necessary for the final project. And that is going to be game tools, so talking about different tools that are available for games. Um, saving and loading games, as well as drag and drop. And so let's get into it. I will switch. Oh, where did my stream deck go? It's all the way over here. So let's switch into that. Oh, whenever I turn off my monitor, PowerPoint likes to change the monitor that my PowerPoint goes to. So let's save that. And now we should be good. All right, perfect. Selection number 16, game saving and loading, game tools, and drag and drop. So game progression and game saving. Uh, of course, a vital part of any game that takes any amount of time to play is to save the player's progress at some point, right? So we're playing the game, uh, we might have to go to the bathroom, or leave to go to work, or there's a power outage or something, and we want to be able to save our progress in the game. Games can be saved in a number of ways, and I'm sure you've all played games that had all of these methods implemented. So, you can have a file save. So, for example, write some data to a file, um, and then when you load data from that file, you will be back to some point that you've um, progressed in the game. You can have something called a quick save, which sort of saves to memory, and then you can recall that save at some point. Or you could have a checkpoint save, which is some place in the level that you touch, that is then, uh, when you go back to that level, you're, say, at that checkpoint within the level. Um, so that's the different types of saves that you can do, but save games can also be stored in a number of ways. So, for example, you could have a local file, you could have a cloud save, so it's backed up to your Steam account somewhere. You could have a temporary save, like a quick save, which is in RAM. You could also have a password save, um, and password saves were very popular back in the days before you could actually store files um, on cartridges. So, not only the fact that you can save games is a decision that you have to make, but when you actually allow players in the game to save their progress, that's also a game design decision. And so, if they can, for example, save and load whenever they want, so let's say you're mid-air in a jump and you're not sure about where you're going to land, if you can save the game sort of at any point, well, you could load the game until you land exactly where you want to, right? So that's sort of a, a quick save or quick load, and that can lead to much easier gameplay for the, the player. Um, what a lot of games do is they allow you to save after a level, or midpoint of a level, so that would be like a checkpoint. Or, sometimes what they do is they implement save locations, so you can only save at specific locations. For example, if you're in a town, or at, you're at a camp, or there's like a, bl a bright glowing um, spot there that you can walk on and save. So, saving between levels um, is probably the easiest way to implement save games. Um, when no entities are currently active in the game world. So in simple games, for example, with no quests, inventories, etc., all you need to do is just save the level number that you're on. So for example, if we're playing Super Mario Brothers, like, you know, one of the first very popular video games, then our progress um, between levels there's nothing between levels, right? It's just a transition. So if we could say, okay, the player is on world four, or um, level 4-3 or something like that, that could be a way that we could save the game in between these discrete levels that have nothing to do with each other. So user progress that we're going to save must be conveyed somehow to the user so that their progress can continue, right? And again, a nice little way of doing this sometimes is just to display the level number. So here, if we're playing like the original Donkey Kong, or we're playing Super Mario Brothers, we've got like World 3-1. So that's World 3, um, Level 1. Over here, on Donkey Kong, we've got like um, the number of lives left, the score, 
um, the bonus, like we are displaying that information to the screen somehow. And then when we actually go to save a file, we can save that particular information. Another common way to display progress is an overworld map which conveys a deeper sense of like immersion or progress. So, I mean, a level number is okay, but wouldn't it be cool if you had something like an overworld map that you had to implement on your project? And so the overworld map here, this is an example from Donkey Kong Country. That's the one of my favorite video games of all time. I'll absolutely never forget when that game came out as a kid. Um, and that's the intro music uh, to this to this lecture as well is from Donkey Kong Country. So here, for example, you have a number of levels um, that are portrayed in this map and you sort of walk around the map to display the level. Um, here is the same thing, but for uh, Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. And this is a more recent example um, of the game Cuphead, where you have uh, players walking around the overworld map in order to select the next level to go to. And here, example, here is another example of displaying progress. Um, so it may not just be that you have a level that you've completed, but maybe you have some sort of level up or power up thing that you're saving as well. So in Cuphead here, you have various weapons that you unlock that you can select from. And so as part of the, the main game map or the, the overworld map, what you can do is you can also select between those options. Here, if you've ever played this game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is uh, the map inside Path of Exile. Um, it has changed since this screenshot, but uh, it's a way of displaying progress, right? So you have some maps that you've completed, some maps that you haven't completed, different shaper areas and stuff like this. I won't get into exactly what this, this means, but it's a way of conveying information about progress to the user. Of course, you can have like experience bars, stuff like this, like how far do we have to go to the next level? Um, not level in terms of Super Mario Brothers, but level um, in terms of experience points. And an RPG, uh, there's a lot of stuff to store in an RPG. And so what RPGs do sometimes uh, in order to help them out in several ways is to give you some various locations that you can save the game at. And so I'll, I'll give, I think I have some examples of those in a future slide. Continuing. So if you don't want to implement some sort of full save for your game, what you can do is you can let the player continue from a given spot. So maybe they can restart the level. Maybe they can restart the world, um, etc. So it's very common in early video games um, when arbitrary save game functionality wasn't possible yet, right? So before battery save games and stuff like that in, for example, the original Legend of Zelda, um, this was a very popular way of doing, um, allowing the user to continue their progress somehow was to actually continue the game rather than implementing arbitrary save. Uh, also these like old uh, beat em up type games, I, the, these like continue screens were always really funny. They conveyed some sort of sense of danger. Like if you didn't continue the game, then you're going to die or something like that, right? And here's the famous one from Street Fighter, where if you were playing this character and you were um, like mid progress through your fight to try and beat M. Bison, then you got a chance to continue at that fight if you wanted to. And of course, in the arcades, this was trying to get you to put another quarter in the machine. Right? So it was like, oh, don't let him die. You got to keep going. Put another quarter in. Or, you know, like, this is really dramatic. I, I Please put another quarter in and keep playing the game sort of thing. So I think that that was the, the origin of these sort of dramatic continue screens was when they really want you to put another quarter in the game so they could keep making money. Uh, and of course, there are... <laughs> A number of different ways that this can be implemented. There are many different game over continue screens. God, this is going way too fast. I should have slowed this down, but there's no right or wrong way to do this as long as you give the player the option to do it somehow. So I briefly mentioned save points. Um, save points make it easier to implement game saving and loading by limiting the, play the places that the player can save and load. And so I don't know if... If anyone else has ever experienced this, but like when you're a kid and you're playing a video game and like, you know, one of your parents is like, oh, Dave, come to dinner. 
and and you're like, well, I gotta save the game first, and they're like, so just save it. I'm like, I can't, I can't just save it. I'm in the middle of a fight, right? So they they and that is completely you you can't use that excuse anymore because you know there's cloud saves and backups and quick saves and stuff like that. But back in the day, you could use that as an as excuse to not go to supper because you had to find a save point. And so what this does is it limits the places where the player can save, so it's kind of annoying for the player, but it makes it much easier to implement. And it's also a game design decision. So typically, static locations that are away from other entities and away from dangerous situations. So they allow us to load the game without worrying about entity storage. Well, what do I mean by that? So here's an example from Final Fantasy VI, or American Final Fantasy III, where you would find these areas, like you're going through a dungeon, for example, and you want to find a save point so that you can actually save your progress. And then at some point, you'll come across a room like this, where there's an entrance to the room, there's a save point, and then there's an exit from the room. And what this does is it ensures that you save in a safe place like this, and the as you play more and more of these sort of like, you know, JRPGs, what do you know is about to happen if you find a room like this, right? Well, you know that there's about to be a boss fight after a room like this. Oh, I'm... Apologies, I've got... Uh, my cat Freckles is here, and he's uh, screaming to get out, so I, I have to let him out, so I'll, I'll be right back. Apologies for that. Sorry about that. I thought he was already outdoors. So yeah, this is a save point where you, um, they purposely put you into this like room where there's nothing else that you have to worry about where you're saving. All you basically have to save are the stats and maybe the abilities that you have and stuff like that. So save points were intentional game design decisions. So they allow you to save in spots like right before a big boss battle. So they give you that sort of thing. But they also force you to make progress, like, through this dungeon. You can't just arbitrarily save every time you make a step through this dungeon and you don't encounter a random battle. So they're actually pretty clever. Um, in more modern games, you get things like this, where you have, um, you have, like, the bonfires in the Dark Souls series of games, where they're placed strategically, like, between... Um, areas of high combat and stuff. You also see uh, save rooms in like Castlevania, in Super Metroid, etc. And all of these things are done in safe locations away from the battles, etc. <clears throat> so checkpoints. Level-based games may want to pro may want a progress checkpoint placed within the level as well. So sometimes you only want users to be able to <clears throat> save after a level, but sometimes you want them to be able to save their progress within the level because levels can be very difficult, they can be frustrating, etc. So it reduces frustration by letting players save mid-level, but it also doesn't allow you to quick load and quick or quick save and quick load to sort of um, you know keep reloading the game to like reduce your random. Um, like, get the randomness in your favor or something like that. Like, for example, in some games where you can quick save and quick load, like, I think, um, in, like, what was that game? In, like, Borderlands, you can, like, there's a boss, you can save, quick save right before the boss, kill the boss, and if you don't like its loot, you can quick load and kill the boss again, and it'll drop different loot, right? So you don't, I don't know, you don't really want the user to be able to do something like that. So these are sort of old school checkpoints where you like run through this little bar here and when you touch the bar then your progress is saved in that level. And here's another type of checkpoint um, in, in Sonic where you can touch this and then if you die you'll reload at that spot. Here it is in Shovel Knight as well. So the checkpoints are pretty easy to implement. Um, if a level has a finite number of checkpoints, which it probably does, just store the checkpoint number along with each level. And so when the player enters a level, spawn them at the position of the stored checkpoint. That, that's pretty easy. And so you can reset the checkpoints when the level is completed such that if they want to replay the level, they'll start back at the beginning of the level. So what data do we actually save? Well, that depends on the saving functionality. 
So if you're only saving after a level, maybe you're, excuse me, you're saving the current levels that you've completed, the level number, um, the current inventory of the user, maybe the weapons that they have. If you're saving at a checkpoint, maybe you also have like quests completed, your party stats, which save point was used to save the game. And if you have something like quick save and quick load, you actually have to store the entire game state, right? So if you implement like quick save and quick load in your game, like the one that you're making for your project, you would actually save like a snapshot of the scene. So where all of the entity are, entities are at any given point, etc. And you're more than welcome to try and do that in the game. It's actually pretty easy to do. You could just copy the scene. And then later on, you could overwrite this, the, the current scene with the copy of the scene that you saved. So it's, it's not that hard to do. In fact, I would say that depending on how your, um, your engine is implemented, quick save may actually be the easiest thing to implement. But if you've implemented it poorly, it may be the hardest thing to implement. Um, why are all these, one second, none of these have, um, animations on them. I kind of want these things to, to pop up one by one rather than all the text appearing on the screen. So just give me a second. All right. So I just went through that. Now, loading a saved game. How to implement loading a saved game also depends on what data was saved, right? So if the levels and items are stored, you can just then recreate the game before that level starts. So if it says, well, I have the shotgun and I'm on map uh, DM3, then I'll just spawn you at the beginning of that level with that weapon. Um, if it's a quick save, we may have to load all of the entities back into memory so that the game resumes from the quick save point. Here's an example that you may have to do for your project because you have to have an overworld view in your project. Um, so save game stores the levels completed. Um, and the current, like, you know, Mario status, so maybe Mario is big or small, maybe it has, a, um, like, the cape in Super Mario World or an inventory in Super Mario Bros. 3. The game is loaded, Mario appears on the overworld map with all of those maps shown, um, with all those maps shown as completed and the inventory is available to him. Um, and so game loads... Game load requires quit to main menu. Okay, so sometimes, uh, I, I'm just gonna remove that because, or game load may require quit to main menu, right? So some games don't allow you to just like save the game and load the game whenever you want. You may have to actually like quit the game, go to the main menu and then click load, what well, load game. That's what I was trying to save there. For a quick save, um, so for example, in a lot of first person shooter games like Quake or Half-Life back in the day, you could just press a button at any time to instantly save the entire state of the game. When a quick load happens, all the entities and game progress resumes right from when the button was pressed. So players, it's really nice for the player to be able to quick save, but they can abuse the quick save and quick load to get past difficult areas or know the outcome of RNG, etc. Password save is really interesting. Um, so what password save does is it takes the current state of the game and it passes it through some sort of hash function, right? So imagine taking the state of the game, like the current level that you're on, maybe your current inventory, your current weapons, etc., and taking that and converting it into an integer somehow. Right? So you're converting your current state of, of Tyson's punch out, like the level that you're on, you're converting that into a number that you have to type in. Or over here in Mega Man 2, you're taking like the current state of your inventory, the current level that you're on, maybe your energy tanks, and you are um, converting that into, well, it's all an integer in the end, but here you're actually typing in, you're filling out numbers in this grid. And there's actually an excellent video here um, by Bisquit about actually how he reverse engineered how the punch out um, password is created. I'm not going to show this whole video here, but I highly recommend watching this video because it's very entertaining and this guy is a genius and he's a bit of an eccentric genius uh, at times, but he's just an absolute genius when it comes to old school game stuff. In fact, the guy who made this video is also the person who created the Task Videos website and is just like, got such a long, he's made emulators and stuff, it's a really great channel. I highly recommend going to check it out. So this is his Cracking Video Game Passwords uh, series. And again, I'm not going to play the whole video here because I don't want to, 
um, just like free boot off of other people's videos on YouTube. All right, so that is game saving and loading. Uh, I'm not gonna give you any code for that because how you implement that on your project is completely up to you, but I highly recommend just using a text file and outputting the relevant information. Game tools, what are game tools? So as you make more and more games, you're going to quickly learn that content creation becomes the most consuming, blah, the most time consuming aspect of video game development, right? So you've got a few different parts that go into video game development. One is like coming up with the idea for the game. Two is um, actually creating the content for the game. Three is programming the game, actually implementing the game. Four is marketing and selling the game, right? And it turns out that in this course, we're focusing on the game programming. Um, and so, but at the same point, at the same time, programming is kind of related to content creation because tools like game tools, game engines, stuff like that, they are programs that assist us with creating um, content for our games. And if you go into game programming, a lot of game companies have their own custom tools that they make, and so this should be discussed in any decent game programming course, I think. And there are internal tools, right? So tools that your game may have built into the game, like for example, a level editor would be an, a, a tool that's internal to the game, but external tools exist as well, like, you know, Photoshop, Blender, Pixel Art, Notepad, all of these tools help for creating content. Um, for more specific asset creation, um, we may need to construct our own tools to help us. Like, for example, you know, if you want to create some, um, some 3D animations, well, you go with Blender. If you want to create like a 2D JPEG or a PNG for your textures, you go to Photoshop. But if you want to create a level for the game, well, there's probably no tool out there that can create your game level for you. So you may have to create those, um, tools on your own. But of course, in the past decade or so, um, game engines have become really popular. So you've got um, a m bunch of different popular game engines that exist for, that comes with tool for creating content, Unity, Unreal, Game Maker, Godot, lots of different um, game engines out there. And these game engines are, are way more general. So meaning that they, you can create all sorts of different types of games in these game engines and they can help with game programming, um, and they also do a great job of illustrating the power of tools for game creation. So for example, here's a video of an older version of Unity, but what this player has done is they've created this custom tool for creating levels in their game inside Unity, right? So they've got some sort of um, like island here that they're drawing and you can see how they're actually drawing the level with um, the mouse rather than having to go to a text file like you do for assignment three and place all of the blocks manually. Here's another example. Um, this is like a road creation thing um, in, I think, is this Unity? Maybe it's, maybe it's, yeah, it's got the Unity logo here. Um, so here the user is able to modify the terrain by drawing in this sort of cobblestone. And you can see that the game engine also places this like little indentation into the, the grass. And so you're kind of creating this like Roman, ancient Roman road through the, through the level just by drawing stuff. And of course there's arbitrary like 3D geometry creation tools. Like you can extrude, um, or you can punch in the level geometry. So here the player is um, taking this level and adding a little hill here by just drawing with this tool that like um, modifies the 3D mesh to allow the, um, the level to, to have higher geometry. Here's another tool um, where you can see that the player is actually moving a road within the game, uh, within the, the editor. So lots of different tools exist. Um, what a lot of game engines have done now is go toward these things called blueprints. And blueprints are a really cool way of visually creating either sequences of events, or maybe it's a visual programming language, or also you can create, um, like I think this person is doing a shader here in this example. And so you can create lots of options and link them together. And essentially each of these buttons is like, this is an input to a function. These functions have outputs and they have parameters and stuff. And so these are like visual editing of things like this have become very, very popular um, because it allows non-programmers to make changes to the way the game works as well. 
And so these are all different types of tools that exist um, for you to create your games. And so if your game is not using a pre-existing engine, you have to create your own tools. And many existing games, um, especially older games, used to come with editors and tools for modding or creating custom content. And the features and power of these tools var varied wildly from game to game. And so I'll give a few examples now. Uh, someone said that the con of blueprints are they are very hard to maintain. Yeah, I can I can see how that could be, right? So not only hard to maintain, but as complexity grows, I've seen some real spaghetti blueprints in the past. Uh, I'm sure you can go like Google blueprint nightmares and you can see a lot of, you know, just it might look like, you know, something messy. <laughs> I can't come up with a good analogy, but they can get really messy as well. So game tools, believe it or not, Back in the day, games were shipped with editors. You could make your own maps in games. So back here, I remember when Warcraft 2 came out. I'm dating myself a little bit. But making my own levels with the Warcraft 2 editor was so much fun. And we could create our own levels. I remember we created like a scaled down version of our town. Um, I'm from St. Phillips in Newfoundland. And we created like a scaled down map of St. Phillips and then battled in it in Warcraft. And it was really fun. Uh, here's a, uh, and I, oh, and you can see up here that like these tools came with, um, you could save and load levels, you could draw the levels, like the, all the different terrain and stuff, you could place, um, units on the levels. Here is, uh, a level editor for Doom. So Doom was probably the most heavily modded game of all time. Um, maybe Minecraft might be more modded now, but Doom was like the first game where the, um, the game was so popular and there were so many tools made for it and the files were so like they weren't encrypted or no DRM or anything like that. So people made level editors for the game. And I remember making levels for Doom back in back in the day as well. And also they had 3D editors. So like editors for Quake levels. I, oh God, how, how many hours did I spend just like making random levels in Doom and Quake back in the day? And the Warcraft 3 editor was so powerful that an entirely new genre of games was created just because they had access to this level editor. So what game am I talking about that recently had like a huge tournament was started in the Warcraft 3 level editor? Does anyone out there know? What genre of video? Okay. The genre wasn't started in, in this editor. But the most popular game of the time was was started. Yeah, so someone said Dota 2. Dota 2 just had this, um, this uh, the, the, the International just happened. Uh, really big Dota tournament. But the original Dota, Defense of the Ancients, was created in the Warcraft 3 world editor. So, like, the one of the biggest games of all time was created as, by, as a mod in a tool that Blizzard released for their game. How times have changed, right? So, now, I said that the, the MOBA genre was created here. That's a, that's not true. The original MO, like the first MOBA that we know about was uh, a mod for StarCraft. I think it was called Aeon of Strife. And then Aeon of Strife, the, the, the creator of Dota was inspired by that to create Dota within Warcraft 3. Okay. Now, the StarCraft 2 map editor is even more popular. This came out in like 2010, I want to say, 2010, 2011. And it's like people have actually made like entirely new genres of games within the StarCraft 2 map editor. It's it's so powerful. Um, I've used this to, to create, I created an arcade game um, inside it like back in the day. It's really fun. And also we have things like now, like Super Mario Maker, where you can make your own levels in different styles of Mario and you can upload those things to, to, um, to be played online by other people. So lots of different level editors um, and they're so powerful and they're so fun to use. Here's actually one of my favorite examples and it might seem really boring to you, um, but I find it really, really cool. So this is called um, Speed Tree. And speed tree is a way of populating your games with trees, right? Because 
you've got to put a bunch of trees in your game, right? You only have one main character. Maybe you only have one main boss, but you're going to have thousands and thousands of trees. And so this software, you know, a company created this speed tree software that allows you to say, generate me 50,000 trees with these properties and like, you know, vary these properties in this way. And like you can, indiv you can individually edit trees like you see them doing here. Um, they have formulas for creating trees. Like they were so good at creating trees that other people use their tree software in their game engine. It's just so cool that you have such a niche piece of software. I love niche pieces of software like that. All right, so those are examples of tools. How do we implement those tools? So game tools are typically made along with a graphical user interface or GUI, as we sometimes say, um, and that includes some sort of menuing system. Um, we're not going to focus on our own fully functional GUI, but we are going to still implement a tool-like interface for this course. Later on in the course, toward the end of the course, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, a UI library that you can use if you want for your level editor and for your game. However, um, we're not going to make like a full UI with it, but it is so easy to use, but I don't have time in this particular, particular lecture to show you. And so without using any external user interface libraries, what we're going to do today is show you how to implement a drag and drop type system. Okay, so here's drag and drop. Um, what is drag and drop? Drag and drop typically refers to the ability to move a UI element on screen from one place to another with the mouse. So you're literally picking up something and moving it and placing it down somewhere else. That's, that's drag and drop. In order to implement a basic level editing tool for our games, we can actually really easy, really easily implement drag and drop via our ECS system. And so what we're going to do is create a draggable component and anything that has a draggable component is going to be able to be dragged. Simple, right? So there's a few different ways that we can accomplish this. Um, so if we wanted to implement a literal drag and drop, like for example, if you're on your desktop, right? And there's an icon on your desktop and you want to move it. Well, this is what you would do. You move your mouse to the entity. Maybe it's a file. You click down on the entity. So you mouse down on the entity. You hold the mouse button down. That starts the dragging. As the mouse moves, the entity moves as well. And then when you release the mouse, you let go and the entity stops there. Now, the really the annoying part of this is that you have to hold the mouse button down whenever you're dragging it, right? So if you want to do some really fine placement and it might take you a minute to like get it in the right spot, you certainly don't want to have to hold down the mouse the whole time. So that's kind of annoying in practice. So instead of drag and drop, what we're going to do is pick up and put down. So what we're going to do is the same thing at first where we click the mouse on an entity, we pick it up, right? And then we can let go of the button and it still has it picked up. And as the mouse moves, we move the entity. And then instead of just releasing the mouse to place it, we're going to click in the final position to let it go. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a draggable component. And I'm going to have a live coding session at the end of this where I'm going to actually just implement this for you. So um, we're going to have a draggable component and inside that we're just going to have a boolean and the boolean is going to say whether or not this entity is currently being dragged. That's it. And then in our input system, what we're going to do is something like this. If the mouse button is pressed, we're going to have some function that says like, oh, get the closest draggable entity to the click position. And if we are dragging the entity, then we set it to false. Otherwise, we set the draggable to true, okay? So this looks a little bit weird, but essentially, okay, we're gonna get the closest draggable entity to the mouse click. That's the first thing that we do. So now we have a reference to that entity. Then I'm going to store this 
Boolean of whether or not that entity is currently being dragged, right? So that Boolean will tell us whether or not we are currently dragging an ent dragging that entity. Since it's the closest thing, that's the only thing that we could be dragging. So if we are currently dragging it and we have clicked, then we just want to let it go. And all we have to do to let it go is just set the dragging to false. Otherwise, if it's not currently being dragged and the click is inside the animation, then set dragging to true, okay? Then inside our drag and drop system, all we have to do is say if our entity, for, for every entity, if it has a draggable component and it's currently being dragged, set the mouse position or set the entity's position to the current mouse position. So that's the end of the slides, but I'm actually going to live code all of that up for you. So I have not uh, practiced this too much. I've got a few notes over here. Oh, you, you saw my notes. Um, all right, so let's go to this screen. And I will, there we go. So I do have some notes on the order in which I want to do this stuff. So let's go do that. Okay. So here, what do we have? I've got an error already. Look at that. So, okay. I need another one, two, three. Okay. I need a closing bracket. So what do we have here? If I run this, what you will see is this is the uh, solution to assignment three. Okay, so this is what you are all currently working on. So I'm going to try my best not to show any solution code while I'm while I'm doing this live coding, okay? But you can see here that I can't click anything, like nothing has happened. I'm, I'm clicking and nothing is happening here. So that's that's it. There's, there's nothing really happening with the mouse. It's not interacting with this game engine. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to modify my action class because now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to have some actions that are input with the mouse, right? Before we only had the ability to do key actions and someone tried to do mouse stuff on the assignment for bonus. Um, I don't, well, I guess you could do this. Yeah, I mean, if you want to implement this as a bonus on assignment three, then you're actually kind of done this part for the project. So yeah, you can implement this for assignment three if you want to. Let me make sure I'm not shooting myself in the foot. Yeah, sure. You could you could do this for assignment three if you want to. So the action class um, previously was like this. It only had a name and a type. But now with a mouse action, well, the mouse has a position, right? And so that position has to be recorded in the action somehow. So here, what I've done is I've put in a position. So this is just pause. It's a vec2. I've created an additional constructor that just also takes in a position. And I've also got a function to give me access to the position. So that's what I've done here is I've just modified the action class to allow for uh, mouse actions. The second thing I have to do is modify the game engine class. So inside the game engine, <coughs> For the assignment, we have this, right? So this is the code that says, okay, if I have a key pressed and my scene, remember, I, I talked about this already, so I'm not gonna explain it too much. Let me make this big enough so that you can see it. It says, if my current scene has an action associated with this key, then do something, right? So we talked about that idea of like registering actions. However, that's more of a keyboard thing because we want to be able to remap keys to different actions, right? So we're not going to modify this system. However, what we're going to do is mouse inputs are not going to be mapped, right? They're, they're not going to be registered in the same way because it's, you know, it's a mouse pointer. You can't really remap the point of a mouse pointer, right? Like it's always going to do one thing as that, and that is point to something. And so, whereas before we had this idea of registering actions and only passing the actions through if they were registered to a scene, well, the mouse button clicks and the mouse movement are sort of always going to be sent to the scene. We don't have to register those because, you know, as I said before, mouse actions are just going to be done um, for you. So, let's have a look at what this is doing. 
Well, these are modifications that I've made and you can feel free to do something like this for the final project. Um, or you can take the code that's on the screen here and do this if you want, that's fine. So the first thing that I'm gonna wanna do is get the position of the mouse, all right? Now I've done it in a very um, suboptimal way here uh, where I call get mouse position twice. Uh, okay, so let me actually do that the proper way so I can say auto mouse pause equals this. That's how you get the mouse position. And then I am going to say that this is mouse pause dot X and this is mouse pause dot Y. So only call the function once, right? And then now we have our current mouse position in relation to the window. That's very important. So when you say SF mouse get position, if you don't pass this in, it's going to give you your mouse position on your screen not relative to the window. So that, that's actually quite important. So what this says is, okay, if my event type is mouse button pressed, then I'm going to do something different based on the mouse button. And so if that was the left mouse button or the middle mouse button or the right mouse button, what I'm going to do is do the action of left click, right? So if the mouse button is pressed, that is the start of the left click. And I'm passing in the position where I actually made that left click. So this is going to be passed into our scenes do action um, system. And so left click, start, and pause. If it was middle click, start, and pause. So inside our game scene, what we can do then is we can actually say, okay, um, I'm, I middle clicked in this location, so do whatever is uh, related to that. Here we have the exact same thing, except this is mouse button released. And so now we have to end those click actions depending on what we want to do. And the last thing, excuse me, is the mouse moved action. So the mouse moved action is mouse move. And if you think about it, mouse move doesn't really have a start or an end per se. Um, so I'm just passing in start to give it like a default. Um, you know, there's no end of a mouse move. I guess the mouse does stop moving at some point, but essentially what you're doing is, is you're just giving your, um, your scene the updated mouse position. That's it. So you are saying, hey, the mouse moved and here is the position that it moved to. All right, and you can get that from event.mousemove.x and event.mousemove.y. All right, so let's go into our game now and I'm going to uh, move this, my notes over here. And then I am going to, what am I doing here? Yeah, so in order to stop from showing solution code, I'm gonna do this, do, 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 scene play. And I'm gonna go down to my do action function. Where is that? Hello, do action. Okay. So here, <laughs> now I'm in my do action function. You'll have to believe me. I just don't want to show you the, the solution code for the assignment. And I'm inside the start of these actions. So I can say else if action.name, right? So up here, you know, I've got my quit, I've got my pause, I've got my toggle grid, all that stuff you've seen before. So if action name equals left click, then, well, let's do something with that, right? So let's do the standard, let's just standard C out and we will say mouse clicked and then action.pause. Um, do I have a two string? Yeah. So action dot two string. So let me just call that. No, I can't do that because um, yeah. So action dot pause dot X and then action dot pause dot Y and the new line. All right, so now I've got my left click in here. If I run my game again, let me really quickly here, I am going to unfull screen this so that you can see uh, more of what's happening. I've got my terminal in the background and now if I click somewhere, okay, cool. So now I can click and it's recording the position of those clicks. So it's outputting those properly. So now I'm clicking inside my window properly. 
the next thing I'm going to do is because I don't, I, I want to be able to debug and make sure that my mouse cursor is in the right place and everything and say, okay, maybe I should, you know, draw something to the screen to help me debug this. So what we're going to do is whenever I have a mouse moved event, I'm actually going to store the position of where the mouse is and I'm going to draw that on the screen. So let's implement that. So inside my scene play, I'm going to go over here to my um, header file and I'm going to add, uh, let's see here, what am I going to do? I'm going to add a vec2 and this is uh, my mouse position. And then I'm going to have an SF circle shape. And this is going to be mouse shape. Perfect. So this circle shape, what I'm going to do here is inside this, this is my action function. I'm going to say else if action.name equals mouse moved. Now this is where my mouse moves. So if I go over here to my game engine class, uh, oh, it says it's mouse move, not mouse moved. That's good. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to do the same thing, except this is now mouse moved. So I'm going to see if this works properly. This is our, you know, we test things. So level now, okay, whenever my mouse moves, perfect. I get an action that, that, you can see it printing in the background. I get an action that says where my mouse is right now. That's great. So I don't want to print that out every time because that's going to be rather annoying. But what I am going to do is I'm going to store that position in this variable. So action.pause, that's what I'm going to set that as. And I also have a circle shape that I set up. So that um, m mouse shape dot set position and that is going to be at m m pause dot x and m m pause dot y okay and now i've set the uh position as well the last thing i have to do is i actually have to set the properties of that system but i'm going to do that uh, that that mouse shape but i'm going to do that in the rendering function and since the rendering function was already done for you for this assignment, then I am going to um, to just, I, I don't mind showing you this code. So the circle shape, this is M mouse shape. I'm going to set the fill color uh, to red. So RGB 255, uh, zero, zero. So that's a red mouse shape. I am going to set the um, radius of that to let's say four so something pretty small but something we can still see i am going to mouse shape dot set origin i'm going to set that to two two so that uh my my circle is actually centered on the mouse rather than in the top left corner of the mouse and that should be all i need to do i think let's see if this works Oh no, I didn't draw the thing. Uh, okay, so down in the, let's do this after all the other drawing so that the um, the mouse cursor appears on top of everything else. So here we go. And now we're going to say M game window dot draw. And that is M mouse shape. Perfect. So now if I go and run my game, what's going to happen? Well, I have this little, you can see a red dot. It's not very big, but it is on my mouse cursor. So that's great. That's what I want to do because I want to be able to make sure that this system is working. And this is the part of the debugging process as well. Okay. So now what I want to show you, however, is something really important. And it is watch, watch this mouse shape. So as I move with Mega Man, oh, what's ha What's going on? Look at this, the mouse shape is not in the same position as my mouse anymore. Why is that? It's because the game world has a different position than the window world. Remember we talked about views last time? So this is one of the things about the assignment, right? Like that the window coordinates 
are no longer the game world coordinates. And the mouse position is given to me with window coordinates. So the window coordinate of my mouse is being reflected in the game world by this position of the mouse cursor. So what I should do is I should actually make a function. And that function should be something like uh, the following. So let's make a function and we're gonna make this function vec2 and this is going to be window to world. And what this is going to do is we're going to pass in a float x. Uh, I guess I just pass in a, a vec2. That's fine. And this const vec2 um, world position. Let's call this world position. And this is going to be a const function. And so what this is going to do is it's going to take in the position of our mouse with respect, um, no, this is, yeah, this is the window position. So it is the position of our mouse with respect to the window, but return the position in the world that that represents, okay? So let's go over to our scene play. I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna go, oh geez, I think I've just given you solution code, whatever. Um, but that's fine. So this is scene play window to world. So in this particular assignment, what is happening is that, well, let's run it again. Oh, this needs to have a return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, return uh, vec2, zero, zero. We have to figure out the translation from a window position to the world position. And essentially what's happening is if Mario, or sorry, if Mega Man is greater than, if his X position is greater than half the screen away, then the screen is scrolling, right? That's what happens. But this is stored in the current view of the, of the game world, right? So let's do the following. Let's get the current view of our game world. So I can say auto view equals m game window dot get view. So this view, we can access this in a number of ways, right? Um, well, we have different properties that are stored in the view, but the view is essentially telling us the x coordinate of the view is the x coordinate of the left hand side of the screen, right? So the, the world coordinate of the left hand side of the screen. So let's just look and we can say now, okay, float x, and this is world x, and this is the left hand side of the screen. Please follow along because I'm doing this live and I may, I, I haven't practiced this. So this is the view dot, what can we get here? So top left, top size, get center, set viewport. Okay, so we can only get the center of the view. If we want to get the, that's the X coordinate of the center, but now we want to get the left hand side of the screen. So that is the window size over two. So we get the window dot size dot X divided by two and we subtract that from the center. So here's what I'm doing. I'm getting, the view only gives me access to the center position. I can't get the top left for some reason. I, I can't remember why, but I'm using the center. In order to get from the center X position to give me this left hand side position, I'm taking the center X and I'm subtracting half of the window width. So that's exactly what I'm doing here, okay? So that gives me the left-hand side of the window in terms of world coordinates. If I add the mouse position in the window coordinates to this, I will get the world position of the, of the mouse position. So if this is the window position of the mouse right here, then the window.x plus the world x is going to be there. 
since my particular game does not scroll in the Y position, then I can just pass window.y in here as well, okay? But if I wanted to be completely arbitrary, if we were scrolling around the entire thing, then I can say something like this, right? So I can do the exact same thing with the Y. However, my game isn't scrolling in Y, but even if it's not scrolling, this should still give me the correct position. So this is my window to world function. And what I actually want to do here is where I set the position of the mouse shape. So M mouse shape dot set position. I want to call window to world and this is on my mouse position. So my mouse position, why isn't this letting me do this? Oh, okay. So I have to get, this is vec2 world pause equals window to world m pause, and this is world pause dot x world pause dot y, because I can't set my position with a vec2. Um, all right. So now what I have is I should be drawing this in the world position rather than the um, the screen position. So, okay, it's working right now. If I keep moving, ah, look at this. I've got the correct world position to draw this thing now. So now if I click, right, it's still printing out the window position of the click instead of the world position of the click. So let's go back and modify that. So where did I say um, left click? Here we go. So now what I want to do is I want to say, okay, um, my vec2 of world position is equal to window to world, and this is action.pause. And now this is worldpause.x, and this is worldpause.y. Now if I come back and I run to the right, a far enough distance, and I click right up in the top left. So if this was printing the window position, it would be a very small number, but you can see here that it's like, it's getting bigger as I run through the level. So that's exactly what I want, right? Great. So now I, I have the world position of the mouse cursor. Now this will work for you. This function will work for you if your game never zooms in and never zooms out, okay? But if it zooms in, zooms out, or rotates, or it has a, sorry, I have hiccups, or it has um, like a mini map view or something like that, you may have to recalculate this. It might be a different function. But now that we have that, let's go back to the left click. And what we're going to do is we're going to detect if an entity has been clicked, okay? Um, now, let, let's, so let's do that. Um, so what we're going to do if we left click is let's iterate over our entities. So we say auto E um, in M entities manager dot get entities, right? And now I want some sort of function that tells me if an entity has been clicked. So let's just go down here um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write, oh, actually I'll just go up to the top of the level and I'm gonna write a function. And this function is gonna be bool because I'm only gonna to want to know um, whether or not something has been clicked. So I'm gonna say is inside, that's gonna say was this, is this position inside this entity? So bool is inside, this is going to take in a vec2 that is a position, and we're going to take a uh, standard shared pointer to entity. What is going on here? Entity, and this is uh, my entity. So this function is going to calculate whether or not the position, this position is inside the entity's bounding box. This is a pretty simple calculation. So what we're gonna do is my entity has, let's see what my entity has. It has um, get component. We have a C animation, right? 
And this animation, I believe, what is going on here? So I want to say auto uh, pause equals, well, this is E pause. This is the entities position. That's what I'm trying to store here. Um, oh, C transform dot position. There we go. So this is the current position of the entity. Now what I want is I want to get, say, the size of the animation so that I can know if I'm clicking inside the animation of the entity. So we'll say um, auto size equals, or maybe half size. I think I'm storing the half size of the entity. Yeah, let's use the bounding box. So E get component C animation. Uh, no, we won't use the half size. We'll use the size of the animation dot animation dot get size. All right. So this is the position of the entity and this is the size of the entity. Now, ah, if you give me a second, I forgot to load up my blackboard. All right. So let's go over to the blackboard. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a blackboard calculation. So here is what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure out whether or not this entity has been clicked. Okay. So here I've got my entities bounds and here I've got the position of the entity right in the middle, right? Cause we're storing entity positions by the center. So the way I'm going to do this, there's a number of different formulas that you could use, but let's say that my mouse was clicked um, right. Oh, I'm trying to use a like a colorblind friendly color. I guess let's use yellow. So if my mouse position was clicked here, oh no, that's not it. Here we go. If my mouse position was clicked here, how do I calculate whether or not that is inside this entity? Well, what I'm gonna do is since the position of the entity is stored in the middle, I can just detect whether or not the X and Y distance of this mouse click is less than half of the X and Y width or height of this thing. So if the X distance right here, so this is the X distance, oops, uh, of the mouse click from the center. This is the Y distance of the mouse click from the center. If this X distance is less than this value, and this Y distance is less than this value, then I have clicked inside the center. That's pretty easy. So let's write that function. Um, we'll go back. So I got the position and I got the size. That's what I need. So now I'm going to calculate um, float DX. And this is going to be the absolute value, right? Because we want to know the distance, not the difference. So the absolute value of um, pause.x minus epause.x. So f abs is the floating point absolute value. We're gonna do the same thing, but for y. So now I've got the amount of distance in the x and the y direction between our position and our entity's position, which is in the center. So now I can say um, return, what do I want to return? Uh, dx is less than size.x over 2 and dy is less than size.y divided by 2. So I'm going to put these inside their own little thingies here. Here we go. Now this should be fine. Do, do, do. All right. This looks like it should work to me. Uh, maybe I want less than or equal to. So I click right on the edges. All right. So this should work, hopefully. So let's go back to where we typed left click. So what I can do now is I can say, okay, if action, if is inside, right? That's my function here. My action dot position, that is where I clicked, right? And my entity, then what I wanna do here is I wanna standard, see out clicked entity and then maybe what we'll do is we'll print out um e get component c animation 
dot animation dot name. So if I have clicked on an entity, I'm going to click, I'm going to print that out. So I'll comment out the other thing. And now let's see if this works. I hope it works because if it doesn't, I'm going to look mighty embarrassed. So if I'm clicking over here, okay, nothing, nothing, nothing. Now for the moment of truth, I clicked a question. Okay. Like first try. Thank God. Uh, I clicked cloud small. I clicked, oh, look, I clicked two things there. I clicked on Mega Man, but I'm also clicking on this bush big, right? Because they're overlapping. So be careful of that. Here I'm clicking on a brick, a ground, a pipe. Phew, that worked. So now I have the code. Oh, and let me also test by going over to the right, making sure that I'm using this properly. Oh, I'm not using this properly. This is not working properly. Why? I don't know. What have I done wrong? Anyone know? I, I know. Okay, so I haven't clicked the world. I'm not checking the world pause. Okay, so what I've got to do up here is use world pause and then I'm passing in world pause down here. So it's the world position that I want to be um, checking, not the window position, which is what's stored in the action. So here we go. Now I'm going to scroll over. And now I'm going to click this thing down here and now it is working properly. Okay. So it's working properly no matter where I am in the world. So now I've detected the entity that I'm clicking on, which is great. So let's go back. And what we want to do really is implement dragging. So the thing I'm going to do for dragging is I'm going to come over here to my components and I'm going to add another component. So let's just add it. Doesn't matter really where we add it. So this is going to be class C draggable public component. So we're adding a, um, a new draggable component here. And then everything is going to be public within here. And I've got bool uh, dragging equals false. So anything that gets a draggable component by default, they're not currently being dragged. And then I'm going to say um, C draggable and this is my constructor and it's just a blank constructor. So um, here we're going to go over to our scene play. And now uh, what I have to do is add that draggable component whenever I create something, right? So let's go do that in a way that is not giving you a solution. So what I'm gonna do, let's see up here, uh, wherever I add, Where's my load level? I don't want to show you my load level code. Okay. So tiles, tile, um, add component. I know I'm not showing you this right now, but I just don't want to give you solution code because assignment three is still out. See draggable. There we go. Uh, so tiles and decks. They have my um, they have draggable components now. Alrighty. So I'm going to go back to the main screen. So my tiles, I like add draggable components to the things that you want to be able to be draggable. Let me ban this person in the chat for spamming. All right. Um, here we go. So what I want to do is I'm going to say, if this is inside, well, that's that's not the only check that I want to do. What I want to do, oh, other thing, when we add a component in here, I forgot to add it to the entity. So now down here, I have to say C draggable. Now we've added the draggable component so that our, our entity now stores draggable components as well. Okay, go over back here. And we're going to say, not only is it inside the entity, but we don't care if it's inside the entity unless the entity is draggable, right? So does this thing have a C draggable component? So if it's draggable and the click is inside, then we clicked the entity, all right? Because that's what I really want. That's what I really care about. So if that's the case, then what are we going to do? Well, what I want to do is I want to set 
remember in our components here, we have this currently dragging. So what I have to do is I'm going to say, if E get component C draggable dot dragging. So what do I want to happen? Well, the easiest thing is if this is currently being dragged, then I want it to not currently be dragged. If it is not currently being dragged, then I do want it to be dragged. So essentially what I want to do is I want to flip this value. So whatever the dragging value is, I want to set that um, is equal to not this, right? So I want it to be whatever it isn't. I want it to flip, okay? And so when I run my game now, make sure this all still works. Well, I'm clicking on stuff. If I click on my player though, watch this, it doesn't print out because I did not give my player a draggable component. So that's good, now it's working. But why isn't anything actually being dragged? I'm clicking on it, but it's not being dragged. It's because the last thing I have to do is I have to make it so that um, anything that's currently being dragged is moving, right? Is, is being placed at the correct position. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to into my scene play and add a new system. And so this is my draggable system, right? So my, or I guess I'll just call it uh, my drag system, drag and drop, let's not, okay, that's fine. We can do that. And then we'll go over to scene play and we'll come down here and we'll add in this system. So this is my scene play drag and drop system. And what's going to happen here is I'm going to iterate all over my entities again. And I'm going to say entity manager dot get entities. And in here, what I'm going to say is that if this has a draggable component and its dragging component is true, then this thing should be drawn at the mouse position, right? So if E has component C draggable and E get component C draggable dot dragging. So if it has a draggable component and I'm currently dragging it, then E get component C transform dot position should be equal to, um, well, what should it be equal to? Well, it's the mouse position that we stored before, but it's not the mouse position. It's the world position of the mouse. So what we do here is we're going to say vec2 world pause equals window to world. And this is M M pause. Remember we're storing the mouse position, right? And now it's the world pause. So let's go back to our game and now let's see if this all works. Boom. Now I'm going to click this. Oh, it doesn't work. Why? Because I'm not calling the drag and drop system. So let's go to our run. No. Uh, what is the function that does that? Is it update? Scene play update. Yeah. Update function. There we go. Do, do, do. Now we are calling our drag and drop system. Fingers crossed. Oh, look at that. We are dragging and dropping things in the level. And the really cool thing about this, in my opinion, is that we can play our game in real time as we are dragging and dropping entities. Look at this. Imagine the game mechanics that you can have on your project with this. So for example, let me show you something that you can do with this. Okay. Let's say that you have something like your goal is to reach this question mark block up here. But all you have maybe are two tiles 
Oops, <laughs> these tiles explode when they touch the bottom of the player. So I just have these two tiles. So I can jump on this one, then jump on this one, then jump on this one, right? Isn't that cool? Come on, you gotta admit that's pretty cool. How, how much gameplay we have just added to our game by doing this, right? So what I recommend, hey, you just saw me do this. If you do what I just did for you in assignment three, you get a few bonus marks, okay? And not only that, but when it comes time to do your project, you'll already have that part done, okay? But do something, you know, you can do something interesting with that. Don't just do exactly what I did. But I don't know about you, but this is, this is pretty neat, I think. Look at this. Name another game that does that that easily and that well. This is the power of ECS right here. Okay? Nobody said anything in the chat. How are you not, like, how does this not blow your mind? This blew my mind the first, first time I did it. So that's dragging and dropping, and hopefully I haven't given you too much solution code to assignment one. All right. So we just talking, talked about dragging and dropping, and now we've done ray casting. Since assignment three, we've done ray casting and line intersection. We've done cameras and views. We've talked about the course project. We've done pathfinding and steering. We've done game tools and drag and drop. And now we are finally going to be ready for assignment four on Thursday. So you can see how our dragging and dropping is going to allow us to build a level editor, right? Because we can just spawn new entities and place them within the level. It's going to be super easy to do. All right, great. So that's it for um, today's lecture. Um, make sure you get assignment three in on time. That's worth a bunch of marks. And uh, please submit your uh, course project proposal or your game proposals for your course project if you haven't done so already, because the faster you get them in, the faster you can get feedback for that. All right, great. Uh, see you in the next one.